Hello, and welcome to the ELEX webinar on solutions for copyright issues in e-learning. I'm Erin Alzi, a member of the ELEX Continuing Education Committee, and I'll be your host for today's webinar. Our presenters today are Sally Bryant and Grace Yee, both from Pepperdine University in Malibu, California. Sally has been the Head of Access Services at Pepperdine University since 2007 and was Head of Technical Services prior to that. She's also the Library Liaison to Screenwriting and Film Studies and to the Division of International Studies and Languages, Screenwriting and Film Studies. As an undergraduate, Sally spent a year at the School of Oriental and African Studies, University of London. She has a master's degree in international relations from American University and an MLIS from San Jose State University. Grace Ye is the digital system librarian and liaison to computer science. Learning from potential new tools to explore scholarly impact has become a new research area for her. Her other major research interests include linked data, system integration, cloud-based systems, link resolvers, and metadata management. Grace holds master's degrees from McGill University in Canada and from Nanjing University in China. Sally and Grace bring much expertise to today's topic, and we are fortunate to have them with us. A few logistics for today's presentation. All attendees are muted to prevent background noise, and we do not have interactive chat capabilities. You may, however, comment on today's presentation using Twitter. The hashtag is A-L-C-T-S-C-E. We do not monitor the Twitter feed, so if you have questions for our presenters, please type them into the question box on your screen. We will have time for Q&A after the presentation. This webinar is being recorded, and you will receive an email with links to the recording and presentation slides shortly after the presentation concludes. And now, we'll turn it over to Sally. There will be a slight delay as we change presenters. Hi, my name is Sally Bryant and I'm Head of Access Services at Pepperdine University. Hi, this is Grace. Um, I'm from um, Pepperdine University. I'm Assistant Librarian. Today we're going to talk about solutions for copyright issues in e-learning. And not only are we going to talk about solutions, but we're also going to talk about the challenges faced in this uh, topic. So Pepperdine University has 12 campuses. It's considered a medium-sized private university. Our campuses are all over the world and also located in Southern California. Our main campus is in Malibu, California, where we have the undergraduate library where Grace and I work. We also have the, the law library and one of our graduate campus libraries. Each campus has a library presence, which might not include a librarian, but would include library staff, and also would include, for the international campuses, student workers, where we train them extensively on library resources. And our international campuses are in Shanghai, Buenos Aires, Lausanne, London, Florence, and the um, our Southern California campuses are Malibu, Encino, West LA, Irvine, and Westlake. We also have a lot of distance learning students. So here's the library. Um, the library, we have uh, more than 1 million uh, collections and we have uh, our staff member, we have around 40, uh, staff member, in, which include the librarians. And in 2009, we implemented OCLC Work High Local as our OPAC system. And in 2010, we, get, we become one of the first li libraries who use the OCLC the, um, WMS system, which is a work at management service. One of the important issues facing libraries today are copyright issues. And we have a direct contrast with this because librarians in general would like to give access 
to our patrons and to our faculty and students and staff. And unfortunately, sometimes we run into a lot of copyright issues and it can be very complicated. So um, there, the problem is the interpretation of the law by the courts must be constantly evaluated for potential impact to libraries. Two major exceptions are the education and fair use, but it's really complicated to have a policy with e-reserves or electronic resources and digital resources. When I first started as head of access services, in the first year that I worked, the Georgia State University case came about where three academic publishers sued GSU and said the un unlicensed posting of digital excerpts for student access almost always exceeded fair use and should require a license. This case has gone back and forth through the courts with the last thing saying the majority of the case was found to be fair use. And we this really impacted us at Pepperdine because we were very concerned about copyright and GSU might have a lot more resources for 10 or eight years of, of lawsuits, but we don't have that kind of money here. So um, a lot of the times we're asked through Pepperdine itself or through the faculty and also RT um, about contributing the library's expertise and working with online content issues. For instance, I've been asked just recently this month about Harvard Business Review cases, and a, they wanted to know if they could put it up on our electronic reserve system. And I'm sure everybody here knows of the, all the problems with Harvard Business Review and how they're very, um, they have a lot of rules and regulations regarding their case studies. And so we advise the professor to have the students buy the case student the case studies individually rather than put them up on e-reserves. I've also been asked about if Pepperdine, the university, has a function, would they be able to put up um, clips from NBC News? And other issues we've had range from professors who are trying to um, use DVDs and maybe want them to be put into streaming and VHS tapes put into streaming, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, it just goes on and on and on. We're always asked as the library for our expertise in copyright issues. And this is uh, our uh, Pepperdine community size. You can see we have uh, so many like uh, policies regarding to the copyright. And uh, yeah, so this this one is the latest uh, email regarding to the copyright. And we got the, um, September 14 from our IT. So you can see, actually, we really are concerned about the copyright issue. And the, the new technology actually make people to share music, video, computer game, and some, any kind of a file very easily. And at the, at the same time, the copyright law is really complicated it's, um, and also ambiguous. So it posed many challenges for librarian and our faculty. So for example, like the print copyright, digital copyright, classroom versus uh, distant learning. And the e-reserve is a certain, is a cer certainly is a, is a good example for us to do some research on this area. And the lab as a librarian, we want to provide the most up, the, uh, up to date course material to their patrons. So, what kind of material will be worry free copyright? For example, link to the full text database, which we have, we subscribe by the libraries, um, maybe consider uh, considers as a fair use. 
And also, like uh, many licenses uh, allow librarians uh, to make cop paper copy of the material and deliver it to our patron. So uh, this is a really complicated issue. So it's uh, we also we also have the issue of streaming video. Yes. So in the last three or four years, Pepperdine has moved into the streaming video. We have Swank streaming video. And Swank does not have licensing agreements with 20th Century Fox. It also only does uh, popular feature films and it does not have a lot of educational or documentary, documentary um, um, content. content. So we have Alexander Street Press. We, we have some educational content on there and we also have We'll buy individual streaming videos and and we'll have those on we'll host them on Canopy. Canopy charges a copy of uh, they charge us a fee every month for hosting. Now the problem with a lot of this is some of it is only still on DVDs, while many of our students have Macs that do not have DVD players. So uh, this semester in particular, I've had a lot of students come up to me and say we don't have um, DVD players, how are we gonna play this? And yet for the library, streaming content is very expensive. And so this is a very complicated issue because it's hard to get multi-use or multi-year agreements with some of this. For instance, the Swank links we have, those are only last a year and then we have to renew them. And then can you put those in a learning management system? Our West LA ca campus is our heads, is our center for distance learning, and they have coordinated with a company to put all the distance learning materials for the professors on this portal. And I've been working with the lady who's in charge of that, and it's very complicated to get a lot of the, these issues, these things on streaming video. Like we've been asked for this old video from uh, the Phil Donahue show and apparently Universal had a fire back in the 70s and it's really hard to find a lot of these issues. And uh, both our faculty and the uh, librarian, uh, we really need a um, fast and easy way to manage our um, copyright permission and to set up the course reading list for our students. So the tool, some better tool are needed to help us in determine whether the course material um, is, uh, has some like a copyright uh, restriction or limitation. So this is our, our um, our course uh, management system is Sakai. So Sakai actually is uh, open source, it's flexible, it's a, a very easy use system. This is, yeah, this is the Sakai system we're using for our course uh, management system. Before, Before Pepperdine had Blackboard, but they moved to Sakai. Yeah. Now, in we had DocuTech for our electronic resource system, but we had problems because they did never updated. They were bought out, but and they were they never updated. And then the server had a problem where it needed to be updated, and they weren't doing the the steps necessary. So in 2014, we looked for a new e-resource system to reshape the library's workflows and better integrate the e-resource service with other campus technologies, including our LMS Sakai. So you see, we have uh, library resources. We have our learning management systems. And our faculty, they want to post their um, curriculum uh, material to their course site and let students access. And sometimes they just ask a librarian to do that for the student. 
So when, uh, when faculty, they do that, they um, really concern is uh, according to their curriculum. They do not, most of them do not base on the availability uh, about the, the material, whether like the library has the, the ebook or the article or not. And also sometimes um, our professors, they reuse the material, like uh, they posted last uh, semester and then this semester they reuse it. When they reuse it, they don't realize actually the, the links they provide actually are not the permanent uh, URL. So it caused the problem like the student cannot access the, the material. And the library resource actually is a very important um, definitely for the students. So how like uh, our, our librarian to dealing with all this kind of certain challenges. So that's kind of, yeah, this is the, and this is the summary about the, the, the previous slide. So this, yeah. And also like a student, uh, sometimes they, they are not familiar with the library resources. So when we implement some new, like uh, the new e-reserve system, the requirement we consider actually is a three um, large category. One is definitely ac uh, easy access. So let our students and our faculty easily access the resources. They can, the faculty, they can easily manage their course material and the, the students, they can easily, they don't need to log in, they don't need to create some like a, uh, their personal account in order to access the course material. And definitely we need to consider the copyright um, themes. And here the Another one is the library system integration. So we have a library holding, we have a course learning um, system, which is Sakai, and we are using um, OCLC system. And definitely we have uh, the authentication piece to consider when we try to implement a new e-reserve system. After DocuTech, we tried for a couple times, we had a lot of meetings with vendors and we decided to settle on, in 2014, we settled on ProQuest CIPIX. At the time, it was just called CIPIX and it was a system from Stanford University. And it was, it was now it's owned by ProQuest for the last two years. So this system, there weren't very many people using it at the time and it helps ev everybody save money. And it, um, it was a great system. We really enjoyed it. The customer service was excellent. The setup was um, actually very complicated as uh, Grace will talk about with all those different parts, it's very complicated. Yeah, the, um, the Zipix is a cloud-based application and it can um, easily connect to our core system. So, and also we need to make sure our library holding can be pulled from our library system to the Zipix side. So that's kind of um, consideration we need. And so that's, again, we have uh, three categories, three large um, challenges um, for the new service, for the new system. So number one is the easy to use and whether we need to hire new people and also the budget issue. And the, another one is the, the system part. So like our Sakai, our library system and our authentication system. And uh, for the personnel, um, it's uh, within the library, like a library system and the access service uh, department. And uh, within the university, we need to work with our IT 
and outside our paradigm, we have to use uh, with uh, ZFIX and OCLC side in order to implement this project. And the, the, the timeline. So uh, we choose ZIPEX uh, in June 2014. So in the summer, we set up our holding, like uh, we pull our holding from OCLC system and to ingest into the ZIPEX system. And the ZIPEX team, they analyze our holding and add our license. Um, and at the same time, we migrate our data from our docky tag to the ZIPEX side. So we actually, we start to use ZIPEX uh, in the summer, like uh, I think it's uh, August or the fall. Mm -hmm. And at that time, we had some trouble, actually had a, um, two kind of problem. One is the students, they still had to create their account. Uh, they cannot like uh, they couldn't like uh, use like after they pass our CAS system they could they need to double double logging so it means actually ZIPEX couldn't um, for like uh, couldn't be fully integrated with our supply system and also like uh, the students they couldn't. Uh, go to the Sakai, their course site, and uh, go directly from the course, uh, the link from course site to the ZIPIC site. So that's two problems we had. And uh, at the end of 2014, after we upgrade our Sakai, we actually, we install some plugin for the ZIPIC. And then like uh, we work with, um, the set of the validation keys uh, in into the Sakai uh, Sakai system, so make two systems talk to each other. So actually, so that's like a December two thousand fourteen, the two systems fully integrated. That's uh, there's a value of taking e reserves out of the library into other learning environments. For instance, when we had DocuTech, it was just us in the library working for um, putting the, the articles on electronic reserve. They would access it through the library website. But now uh, when we pick SIPICS, we really wanted um, something that would be integrated with other um, people in Pepperdine. And so that way the library was much more involved and the students didn't have to go somewhere else. So it, um, it was Access Public Services, Pepperdine IT, SIPIX, and then um, the other library systems that Grace just talked about. And it was so it was a, a lot of collaboration, particularly with Pepperdine IT. And also um, SIPIX itself, because uh, they were very responsive, they have great customer service, and uh, we were very happy working with them. And they really, over the years, they really worked on CIPIX itself. And so um, there were new things all the time. So here are the teams uh, that we uh, needed to get this off the ground. And it did take a lot of work to get access to CIPIX um, I mean, Sakai itself was very complicated and we really had to negotiate with IT because when you are putting um, readings into individual courses, you have access to all the behind the scenes of Sakai itself. So Grace and I have um, access to a lot, but um, let's see. yeah. And this is our course side. So this is our course size. So on the right top corner, we have a Pepperdine. Uh, we have a Pepperdine login. So when you click on login, um, you then you go to, you will be direct to our CAS site. So you need to use your Pepperdine credential to access. So, 
Sakai itself is always updating and we have to take that into account. And so a lot of the times, like we just had a big um, overhaul of um, Sakai itself. And so now it's on version 11. And when we do that, we have to make sure that SIPIX is also has the, the correct plugin. So when we go in as a library staff and we add core, um, things into Sakai, which Pepperdine calls courses, we have um, delegated access, as you'll see on the left. And then we go into the system and we, um, We, put, we search for a course by using the instructor name and the term and then the school. And then we get access to the course. So here's an example of a screenshot of film 111. And now uh, we have access to this course and we click on the site information in the course. And we are able to add CIPIX readings for this particular individual course. When we add the CIPIX readings, then we are able to, um, to it comes up on the left-hand side of the, in, the courses. Then the CIPIX itself is in Sakai and we're able to click into SIPIX and we're able to add readings for this particular course. So when you, you click on the and when you click on enter uh, ZIPIX, so you can see like from the left uh, left side uh, is a film 111.01. So just remember that course. Um, and then you can see the that course information was transferred to the ZIPIC site from our course site, that's automatically. And this is the, like the renewal, we usually use every semester um, when the semester begin. We have, um, we renew courses as well. We have a lot of instructors who maybe make one upgrade of their um, course readings, but in general, they keep the same things year after year. Now, with DocuTech, we had, we considered our print holdings as able to be um, copyright material, and we would put things up, we would scan items in and put things up on DocuTech, and then we'd go to, um, the Copyright Clearance Center, and we would get clearance for the class. With CIPIX, it's different because with CIPIX, when you add the readings, they only consider um, e-books and other readings as in your holdings. So when you add a reading into CIPIX, you, um, they have, they just, um, they have a summon search bar and you search for your item and then your item comes up and you're able to either add it to the course if Pepperdine already owns it. As you'll see on the left, it says subscribe by Pepperdine University and you could add it to the course. Or as you'll see on the example on the right-hand side, it says find a license. So if you wanted that one to find a license, then you could either search the CIPIX collection. Um, the library subscription obviously came up with no matches public domain came up with no matches, but then there's a copyright agent and it would be estimated 32 cents per page to add this to the course. Then you um, fill in the, the page range in the year and you add the reading. So the reading is now successfully added and then um, it will be injected back into uh, Sakai courses. So you'll see on this tab, um, here is the resource page for the class. And then here, those are some of the CIPIX readings. It says full list of CIPIC readings for this course. 
Yeah, this is very, very different from what we had before. So this is our new website. Um, this is like a, from the new website, you can see the course reserve. And this is a, our old one is 2016. Uh, we put e-reserve uh, accessible through our course sites, um, but comparing to now as a 2007, we took over, like I took, you know, remove all those links from our website. So the student actually, they don't need to go to the library website. They just need to go to the course site and access their um, uh, reading staff from each course. Now there's a great impact on this. For instance, when we had DocuTech, the, um, they had to go to the library website. Now they don't have to go that they go right through their courses. So, and also we are charged for copyright if we don't own the material by the number of students who actually use the material and download it or print it out as opposed to before when you would just say, oh, I think there's 25 people in the class and then you would pay for 25 people for the copyright. The look of it is very, um, it's great. Everything is um, OE. We are, and it looks fantastic with the with the way that it comes out with the um, readings. And so usability is great with this kind of electronic reserve system. And our students and our professors really like it a lot. And they feel um, much more protected because I think what happens is is um, sometimes professors will go through their prior university's holdings and find things or they'll want to put up a youtube video and it will go away or they want um i mean there's just so many um obstacles sometimes they'll do it themselves and they'll miss a page and um, there's all these other complications of um, putting things up by themselves as professors Now we want to talk about the future. So when we decided to do this presentation, I believe it was in the spring, and we, uh, as you can tell, we really love Sipix and we love their customer service. And uh, a lot of their improvements have been fantastic in terms of usability and also quality. And it's made it very easy. It's very streamlined and simple once you get the hang of it. And then um, the Monday before ALA annual, uh, CIPIX asked Grace and I to be on a webinar with them. And then they told us that actually CIPIX is gonna be going away uh, as of June, 2018. It's gonna become part of Leganto. So um, this was, was actually quite a shock um, to us. And um, I think, Grace and I were talking about this earlier, and, and we think that this is a, a good test case because it's very typical in the library world for something like this to happen where, you know, you get a new system four years ago, they're bought out by a, another company two years ago, and then um, either the customer service changes or something changes. And in this case, now, um, CIPIX is going to become the back end of the Leganto system. And I think uh, there's a lot of consolidation in the library world. And um, it creates a lot of problems. And I guess it's good in some ways, um, like Grace will probably talk about it, but um, we are, um, we do not have Alma, we have uh, OCLC. Yeah, so from actually this two slide, uh, we borrow from the vendor side from their presentation. Um, you can see uh, the Zipix platform will close in 2018. And uh, the second point uh, is uh, our existing feature set does, uh, does not 
fully meet our vision. So when they decide to close the ZPIX, they had a problem. Actually, they had a problem. Most ZPIX customers do not have armor. But at the same time, the armor is a requirement for Legato. So finally, they have a sound like an internal conversation. And finally, they, have, they are able to get an agreement from armor team that they would find a way to implement a mini version of armor for Zipix customer to support the reading list function that Lacando has. And that's the only for the Zipix. Yeah, that's the only way for the Zipix customers. We were paying uh, a little under 5,000 for Zipix. And then we also paid the copyright fees. Um, they were, they, Zipix was created by a Stanford lawyer. And so it is very uh, copyright intensive. Every single article and everything put up their book chapter, everything is to the letter. And I actually found that very comforting because I knew that we were completely in compliance and I knew that there were no problems. And also I never had to, to be truthful. I never really had to do much. It just was automatic. So they would bill us for that. And then they, um, and so it was just seamless and easy. When we went into the webinar of um, them changing to Leganto, uh, Pepperdine, we were offered the um, next year as the fee for as $10,000, which is double what we uh, are paying right now. And that was a special fee. Now, um, we did, you can Google the, or you, you know, YouTube videos of Leganto. I mean, it's a, it looks gorgeous. I mean, it really is nice. I mean, everything looks fantastic and we would love to be a part of it. The question is, is it is um, expensive even for us as a former CIPIX um, uh, company as somebody who had it previously. Yeah, actually, this price um, is a unique price for only for the Zipix customer because of the change. And for the armor customer or for the uh, some libraries, they don't have armor and they want Lacanto, they need to contact X Libras to get the quote. So this is our concern. Um, one is the integration with our OCLC system. And uh, Lagando has a uh, one unique uh, tool which called Site It widget. Uh, it's used um, on the web browser. When you use it, you, you turn it on. It will, like if you go to the Amazon, you find some um, book or some um, ebook you want you can just uh, easily add to your holding and use it but does it work with OCLC system um, the answer I don't know and also the authentication so again we are using CAS um, which is not an easy system so the question then the answer I got from the vendor side is uh, currently Lagando is only available for armor um, customer. They will do the same way to get our holding using OCLC API, but they haven't developed the workflow for non-armor customer. There's a no OCLC customer use a Lagando. And when they decide to close Zipix platform in favor of moving to the condo, they had a problem. Like I said, most Zipix customers do not have armor. So, and armor is the requirement for the condo. Yeah, so the, the offer to non-armor uh, library is a unique. 
and it's not repeatable. So that's a uh, that's kind of problem we have. So now we're trying to figure out what we should do for the future for us and for our e reserves. Like, should we try this um, le version of Leganto, or our, you know, should we look for another system? So um, it is a problem because a lot of our professors are very used to us doing um, electronic reserves for them. And um, so this is just a quandary that we face for the future. And we're going to need to decide, decide really quickly because this is all going to happen um, by June of next year. And um, so I think that we had a great experience with CIPICS and I think um, electronic resources um, are very complicated and complex and the copyright issues that uh, we face is they're only going to grow worse I think as time goes on because there's more and more complications with um, everything going to ebooks everything going to uh, you know journal articles that you you if you don't buy the database, then you aren't going to pay. And then the price goes up so high every year with all of these resources. So there's so many budgetary issues on libraries, streaming video um, and other um, types of media. And, you know, um, so it's very complicated for the in the library world right now. So this is like a Q&A, so if you have any question, just let us know. All right, thank you, Grace. Um, this has been really great. And so as Grace said, we now have time for questions. Uh, if you have not yet done so, please type your questions into the question box that's in your GoToWebinar control panel. Um, we do have a question already. It's a uh, it's a very specific case in which the submitter was looking for advice on a situation. Um, so it, she has a professor who has permission from the author of an out of print textbook, um, permission from the author because the publisher is no longer in business. Mm -hmm. And the permission is to use the text only portion of a PDF that the professor had found online. And so the author has given the professor permission to distribute electronically to his students and not to print it and to use it for one year only because a new edition of the textbook is coming out. Um, so the question is that this person is she's thinking of putting the textbook on e-reserve and keeping it password protected for one semester only. Uh, and then they asked you, can you think of any options? I think that sounds like the best option. You definitely need it password protected. When we had uh, DocuTech, I somehow a professor made his own login and then made um, his course available, all his electronic reserves, and it and I found out it wasn't um, password protected. So I think um, to me it sounds like all the due diligence was done. I mean the copyright was granted. It was granted for a limited time, and um, and so I think a password protected electronic resource would be the best way to go. Um, all right, thank you. And the next question is, how did or how do you handle items that faculty want to put on reserves that are not available electronically? Um, do you mean like, videos that are not available we if so if a video is not available then we unfortunately we have to say go to the dvd and we'll um, try to purchase the dvd of it if we're able to if it's electronic resource that is like a journal article um, we have actually bought individual journals themselves like sometimes a professor will want a specific journal, like the whole journal, they'll want it to be available. So we have bought them electronically the whole entire journal, one issue um, for that purpose. And would you do the same thing for books? 
Yes, I always try to, because of our um, SIPIX, SIPIX, if we have it in an ebook, we're able to easily put up, um, like they're very specific with the number of pages or chapters, and sometimes um, that has to be, um, we have to ask SIPIX about that, because sometimes if, um, every publisher sometimes has a different amount of pages that they want, that they consider um, that anything beyond that is um, not acceptable. So we have bought eBooks in the past for that. And um, we've also had it so that a, a chapter will show and then it will go away and then an another chapter will show. And that's easy in SIPIX because you can pay the copyright for that kind of thing. Um, but it is very complicated because you have to be careful with um, all these outside forces dictating the copyright. And on, along these same lines, are you digitizing any of the print book material or is this just ebooks no. that you purchased for that? No, we actually, if, we, if we're unable to get the book in ebook, then what we do is we'll, um, we'll go through the SIPIC system and we'll just take the certain chapters that were allowed and then we um, pay for the copyright. Okay. Uh, the next question is that when using SIPICs, did you have any fair use criteria where you don't have to pay for a license to put on to add electronic material? We've had some cases. We had a um, similar to the first question. We had a professor who had an old article from the '70s, and then um, the publisher granted him the copyright. So then Sipix asked him if he was the copyright holder. He said yes, and then we were able to um, put that up. We so we've had certain cases where um, it is. Um, where that is certain situations like that has happened. But in general, I think that um, SIPIX is extremely copyright protected, more so than just using fair use criteria, like we pay. Okay. Um, <laughs> and then we had someone who just wanted a clarification. Did you say there was an option for using Leganto without Alma? Yes. Yes, yes. Um, they actually, they basically, they will build uh, a mini version, a mini version of our. Um, sorry. So. Yeah, basically, uh, they will build a mini version of armor for the non-armor customer. But. Uh, sounds like they haven't developed some workflow uh, for the Zipix customer. So that's kind of the answer I got. We did watch a video of Leganto, and I'm sure that it's improved since then because that was in uh, June. And now, so I'm sure it's improved since, but we're not quite sure where they are in the process of of um, doing Alma Light or whatever they're going to do to have people access it without using Alma. Yeah, and also the question is uh, right now there's no OCLC system like uh, uh, no library who use OCLC system who want to switch over to Lagando. So that's a uh, yeah, that's another challenge for them. Okay. Um, and then we just had a question in relation to this again. Um, can you just let everyone know what Alma is for those who aren't familiar with it? Um, Alma actually is a, uh, it's a library, it's just like a li integrated library system. It's from the x -Rebers. Um it's a, like a, the new generation, just like OCLC uh, WMS system. Thank you. And then when we were talking about Leganto and Alma, we had a question come in about it. Some it is it much more expensive? Um, I'm not sure. I know that for us, 
getting Leganto is expensive, but I'm not sure if you're an already an Alma customer. Um, it just comes with it. It's just integrated into it, right? Yes, for like uh, for the Alma customer, you need to contact your um, representative, your ex Libre representative. Um, and the price. Do you mind if I speak? Oh, yeah, because we have it. Yeah, sorry, I apologize. Um, because okay. we just started with Leganto, and it is an additional cost when you already have Alma. It's an additional module to add on, but the actual cost, as they said, would have to be worked out with your representative. Yes, I think so. You need to contact. Uh, like the price we show is only for us. It's a unique for the Zipex customer. Mm hmm. Um, and all right, if we have any more questions, we're starting to wrap up, so please make sure that you get those entered. Um, we did have a question earlier in reference to digital manuscript material, uh, and just if you could speak a little more about the copywriting of that when professors have asked to have that digitized for their course management system. So it's a manuscript that they um, they have the copyright for? Or uh, it's digitized manuscripts that have already been or manuscripts that have already been digitized. Um, so uh, is, are there copyright issues in adding that to the course system? Well, I think if it's in a database, then and your university or college has access to it, then no, there wouldn't be anything because CIPIX and I think a lot of these new uh, next generation um, companies, they have your holdings in them. So that would be considered part of your holdings. If it was in like dissertations and theses, we, we have that database. So I think that would be um, fine as well. Okay, thank you. Um, and we're back. We have a few more questions about Leganto and CIPIX. Um, so the first is, we just need another clarification. If someone is using OCLC WMS, Leganto is not an option. Is that correct? Um, well, right now, like uh, I, I just check um, with them like a couple of weeks ago, and the question is, they haven't looks like they haven't developed some workflow for the OCLC customer. So maybe, but, but they say they're going to. They, yeah, they're going to, but it's depend on how many customers they have, I think. So maybe you need to check with them. Okay. And then do you know of other tools similar to this that those who are using WMS can use it instead? Well, we were looking into, we have a lot of SpringShare products and we were looking into SpringShare electronic reserves, which uh, the, the founder of SpringShare is actually the guy who came up with DocuTech. He's, he was, that was his company and now he's in SpringShare. We use a lot of their uh, modules already. And so we're debating about that if we don't go to the Leganto, uh, we're not quite sure. Uh, yet we will have to make up our minds soon, but that is an option. That is, um, it is updated from DocuTech, but it looks similar to it in a lot of ways, but you can also put a course, you can put a link into a, an LMS le learning management system like Sakai or other ones, you can put a link into it. And so they will have their resources available, similar, I think, to CIPIC. Great, thank you. We also had an attendee respond. Um, so to whoever who had asked that question, we have someone else out there who uses LibGuides e-reserves and they say that it's good, but it doesn't have the copyright options that you would have in Civics. Yeah, I, I noticed that too. The, um, it, it, it is a lot cheaper system, but you, I think you do have to go through Copyright Clearance Center again to get a lot of the copyright. Yeah. Um, all right, well, that seems to wrap up all of our questions. So thank you very much to both of you. Um, we are 
extraordinarily glad that all of our attendees could be with us today, and you all will soon receive a short online evaluation form, so you could please take a few minutes to respond to those questions. The comments are very valuable and help the Elect Com Continuing Education Committee plan future events. The email will also include links to today's slide and recording, and you now have the opportunity to receive a certificate of attendance. That information will also be in the email. So thank you again to our presenters, Sally Bryant and Grace Yee. Thanks also to members of the Continuing Education Committee, Mary Reeder and Wanda Jazieri, and to Megan Doherty from the ELECT's office. The support they provide make it possible for us to present these webinars. Alex has other continuing education events coming up. We have seven more webinars this fall, the next one being a two-part series on Python and PyMark, taking place October 18th and 25th. Please see the ELECT website to register or to find more information on these. And finally, ELECT offers web courses, which are four to six weeks long, as well as two-day email discussions. Our next e-form will be on October 24th, discussing the ins and outs of journal collection development. Check the website for information on upcoming courses and discussions. And thank you again for joining us today, and this will conclude our session.